Canada's current six-month mandate in the fight against Islamic State ends April 7th. The proposed extension sees Canada involved for a year and includes strikes against Syrian targets. Joining us now for more on the merits of the plan and what plans there are, if any, for an exit, here's Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst, founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the U of T. Janice, welcome back, as always. How successful do you think the six-month mission in Iraq has been so far? There's no question, uh, Steve, it's accomplished a minimal but important objective. It has contained the spread of ISIS. It stopped them in their tracks, and it's been able to push them back in one or two key strategic areas, like Kobani. And what do you think the Prime Minister's thinking is by extending the mission for a year? Well, the year, um, it's no coincidence that there's a federal election. Uh, in the middle of this year, so renewing that mission in that context uh, would uh, make it even more prominent politically than it is. That year gets over the federal election. So it takes it takes us past the federal yes, election. It does. does it therefore? How does it how does it potentially have an impact on the federal election campaign, which again we're we're assuming will be in October? Yes. Um, from what we know, public opinion polls say that a majority of Canadians support this mission. I would be very surprised, Steve, if this were a ballot question in any way. Canadians don't normally vote on foreign policy issues. And we have a very small number of Canadians uh, active in the mission. Six aircraft, two logistical aircraft, 79 Canadians on the ground. It could grow a little bit, but that's historically a very small issue. What could change this? is some dramatic casualty. That would put it on the front pages of every newspaper. Uh, I usually don't ask you your opinion on things. I usually ask you to analyze things. But uh, I do want to ask you your opinion. Do you favor the expansion of the mission? So let's break that out. Do I favor the extension of the mission? Yeah. Yes. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, you know, it, it has played a crucial role in stopping ISIS in its tracks, which is very important. The expansion of the mission uh, which you alluded to, which is Iraq and over the border into Syria. Into Syria, that's different. And that's a different issue. So let me say right off the top, we don't know what that means. Uh, we need to understand first what we call the rules of engagement. What are the rules that Canadian pilots are going to have to follow? When can they cross the border from Iraq into Syria? So paying attention to what we've been told, it sounds to me like the following, but I haven't seen the rules. It sounds to me that when they are pursuing Islamic State fighters that cross the border from Iraq over into Syria, they can engage in hot pursuit. That's, that's a reasonable strategy because what we've learned over the years is if you have a safe haven over the border, mm -hmm. like the Taliban had in Afghanistan, you actually never defeat them. They just regroup and come back. Are there risks attached to this? Absolutely, and there are two big ones. What are they? First big one is um, you're implicitly supporting Bashir al-Assad and a regime which is using barrel bombs against its own population. And which you've actually sworn to overthrow yourself. Absolutely, and that's a contradiction, and the U.S. is struggling with that contradiction, and that's a tough box to be in. No good way out of that one. The second tactical risk is Syria still has very good anti-aircraft defense. It shot down a Jordanian pilot. Um, and so the possibility of an aircraft uh, at risk is real. From Syria or from I ISIS fighters in Syria? Well, there's, there's two separate issues here. One is ISIS fighters in Syria, who were the ones, I should correct myself, were the ones who shot down that Jordanian pilot. But you have to coordinate with Syrian air defense to make sure that they know that it's a Canadian aircraft in hot pursuit of ISIS fighters over the border. Yeah, because we've already lost a soldier to friendly fire in this That's war. That's right. right. So you would have to coordinate. And once you coordinate, frankly, you're working um, tacitly together uh, with the Syrian Air Force. <laughs> That's a conundrum. That's a conundrum. Is this one of these situations where the enemy of my enemy is my friend? This is one of these situations where there are no good options. Right. And you just try to choose the least bad amongst them. Hmm. But it's not surprising, Steve, that that's where the debate is in this country. It's about that crossing the border in hot pursuit uh, element. Let me ask you the, uh, what I think is the bigger overarching question here, which is 
really, how big of a direct threat to Canada do you think ISIS, ISIL, Islamic State really is? So I'm one of the ones who argues that uh, the Islamic State uh, is not as big a threat as uh, everybody has assumed. To Canada. Well, let me, let, let me qualify for a minute. Why is it not? Because paradoxically, it's fighting a very old-fashioned war. It controls territory, unlike Al-Qaeda, which never did. And that capacity to hold on to territory is crucial to its future. When it starts to lose territory and get pushed back, it's going to lose its appeal. So this is not the toughest problem that we face in the Middle East. It's important to say, however, that if you track um, pronouncements of the Islamic State, Canada is in the crosshairs. They have encouraged uh, supporters and sympathizers to take action against Canada, as well as the United States and others. Uh, so it's all about the tolerance that we have in this country for any kind of attack that would resemble what we experienced in October. We don't have a lot of experience with this. Um, it's something the public really fears. Um, and so there is a short-term risk that there will be other events of the kind that we saw in October. So that's a more direct consequence. How about yes. a more indirect consequence? Does the fact that there is still mass chaos and countries unable to control their own borders and all of that, does that, do you think, have an impact on Canada? It does because what we're seeing is more broadly is what I call the unmaking of the modern Middle East. Uh, if you look at the Middle East right now, it's truly terrifying. You have Syria that is in the midst of one of the most brutal civil wars, millions of refugees, hundreds of thousands dead. Iraq, um, uh, an army that collapsed under threat that is struggling to put itself together again. Libya, an all-out civil war going on now in Libya. Yemen, which um, is exploding now again into civil we'll war. We'll get to that. And yeah. we're going to get to that. Egypt, which escaped that largely by returning to military rule, which is even more repressive than it was under Hosni Mubarak. 40,000 political prisoners. That's right. Yeah. Um, so this is a terrible period in the model, modern Middle East. And there are refugees, immigrants, diasporas in this country and all over the world that are connected uh, because we live in a global age. So the, the really what I, I, chaos is not strong enough. We have to talk about the fires that are burning in the modern Middle East right now. Um, have licks of flame that spread all over the world. To that end, you know Francis Fukuyama. I'm going yes. to uh, read you something from uh, what he wrote in the American Interest just a few days ago. He says, the starting point for a sensible policy rests on the realization that the U.S. and other democratic countries have no reason to favor one religious sect over another in the Sunni-Shiite war. What the outside world does have an interest in keeping the conflict from spilling over into other countries and in protecting innocent people from butchery to the extent we can. This implies that our optimal policy should be one of containment. Mm -hmm. That is, the U.S. and its friends should use air power and military assistance to ensure that no one group, whether ISIS or the Assad regime, gets so strong that it can impose its will on the region. Is he right? He fundamentally right, but it goes too far because in that last sentence of the statement that you read, Steve, is an interventionist, interventionist meddling kind of strategy. Let's try to balance the forces. And if you want to be cynical, you could even read into that. Let's make sure they keep fighting each other and no one side wins. Mm -hmm. So, but I think the fundamental argument is absolutely right. This is about containment. It's about trying to build in so far as possible and that's why the airstrikes have made a difference. It's about trying to stop the spread. Uh, first of all, in the broader Middle East, we already have four countries on fire. And then beyond that region into other parts of the world. But fundamentally, this is post-revolutionary transition. We have a broken order. The only people who are going to remake this part of the world now are Middle Easterners themselves. They themselves. And it's going to take a long time. We are talking about decades of working through these kinds of conflicts. And we have very little leverage inside. 
we have to understand that we are outsiders and our job is to contain, 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 but not to fool ourselves that we can lead. Let me pick up on his point about Assad. Are you concerned that by helping to try to degrade and or destroy Islamic State in Syria, we're helping Assad stay in power? Yes, I am concerned about that. So what do we do about that conundrum? We're very late in that game, unfortunately. Uh, you know, Syria is polarized now between uh, Assad's forces and Islamic State, both extreme. Um, the United States is trying to push that back and create an opening by training so-called moderate Syrian forces over the border uh, in Turkey. I'm not optimistic. They're some very small in number. They're not battle-hardened. This is going to take a long time. And uh, anybody who gets involved in any way in Syria right now is helping one of those two uh, unsavory. Um, you know, uh, the, the UN just issued a report that Islamic State has engaged in genocidal activity uh, in, its, uh, by, in its attempt to eliminate the Yazidis. Uh, Assad is engaged in war crimes. There's no question about it against its own population use chemical weapons and barrel bombs. Um, there are no good choices uh, in Syria. Um, and the challenge for everybody else is, as you're pushing the Islamic State back, how do you engage to the minimum degree possible in Syria so that Islamic State does not have the capacity to send troops over the border where they can hide until and, and come back the next day, but restrict your intervention only to that kind of activity. Let me get your opinion on this, because I do remember back in the 1980s interviewing an Israeli official uh, when Iran and Iraq were at war. Right. And we said, I asked him, who, who do you want to win this war? You as an Israeli, who do you want to win? And he said, we hope they both continue to lose. A, a, in some respects, cynical answer, because it means the continuing deaths of lots of people. But on the other hand, from a geopolitical point of view, you can understand where he was coming from. Is that what we should be hoping for here when it comes to Assad versus Islamic State? Yes. I mean, in that particular case, Steve, um, I think these are two um, extreme actors in the region who violated every, to the extent there are any rules, and there are not many left in this part of the world at all. This is a brutal neighborhood right now, um, really brutal in a way that Canadians have real difficulty comprehending. So and the, let them kill each other. Well, we don't want to support either of them. Right. Um, that's yeah. true. I, I, there's one more point to add, though. This is a moment where Iranian influence in the Arab Middle East is greater than it's ever been before. So yeah, certainly in Syria, uh, they propped up Syria. They've allowed Hezbollah to get involved on the ground in Iraq. You have the, the, the Iraqi army is largely Shia-led at this point, and it's advancing into Sunni territory. Uh, this, you know, the Iranians are pleased with their capacity now to, in, to grow their influence in this part of the world. And it's that that I think people have to pay attention to, too, that we want to balance there. Um, we do not want uh, the collapse uh, Sunni populations and Sunni governments uh, and, a, and a Middle East that is ruled by one, by any one of the peripheral powers, whether it's Iran, whether it's Turkey, or whether it's Israel. It's always controversial in these kinds of conflicts to talk about quote-unquote exit strategies. Yeah. But should Canada have one? There's no exit strategy. Um, I, I think we have to understand, I, you know, I wish our governments uh, whatever, of whatever political stripe, just level with the Canadian public. And said? Ten years. We're here for ten, ten years. Ten years, exactly. You know, I'm more optimistic about what we can do with the Islamic State, that we can push it back in a much shorter time than that. Uh, but you look at the chaos in this part of the world, Steve. This is a long struggle. So we need to craft a strategy, which, and here's where Frank Fukuyama is 100% right, which is wholly focused on containment, mm -hmm. and then leave our inflated pride about what we can actually do on the ground at home. Well, somebody, who was it? I can't remember who said in the National Post yesterday morning, where, where he said all of those who are you know, deeply opposed to this mission Let's get some reality here. We're not invading Russia. No. We, we've got six planes over there and, and a few That's dozen all. other people, right? That's all. I mean, we are making a small contribution. Um, 
the broader mission, um, and I supported that mission right from the beginning, because Islamic State was on the move. It was rolling, and air power made a real difference in stopping what was a well-organized but small fighting force moving in trucks. We stopped their capacity, moved down the highway, and we intervened at a critical moment, and it really mattered. But we got to understand the limits of what we can do. Okay. In our last few minutes here, when you gave that list of countries that were burning. on fire, burning, uh, one of them that you mentioned was Yemen. Yeah. And Saudi Arabia is now leading a coalition of groups that are dropping bombs on Yemen yes. from the skies. What's going on there? So it's fundamentally, uh, the Houthi population of Yemen, which is which they claim themselves follow Shia practices, but other Shias don't always agree, um, have come out of their mountainous area in the north and pushed the president of Yemen back into the south. Now that in itself is not a terrible thing because Yemen had been two countries before, north hmm. and south. Communist well, south and exactly. non-communist north. North, right? And that's in recent historical memory. What's happened in the last week is the northerners crossed down over into the southern border, surrounded the southern capital, Aden, pushed the president uh, out of Aden. There are rumors that he's fled the capital. We don't know, which would then mean that, again, a Shia group would control all of Yemen. That's got the Saudis jumping out of their seats, literally stop that. Yemen is right on their southern border, um, and they're determined that that will not happen. So what you're going to see in Yemen is what you're seeing all over the Middle East right now, Steve. You're going to see the coalition of Sunnis digging in to resist what they see as a Shia advance into historically Sunni territory. And just as you indicated before, the tentacles of Iran in other countries, do you see them in this one as well? Absolutely. Absolutely, they have provided support logistics um, uh, to the Houthis that are coming down. You know, one interesting piece of news uh, was that the U.S. Has, is now engaging in airstrikes against Crete in Iraq. Why are they doing that? Because the Iranian commander of the revolutionary force, of the Al-Quds revolutionary forces, Suleiman, had led the assault. The U.S. did not want Iranian-led um, and advised forces to take to Crete. Mm -hmm. He's now left the country, and the U.S. is now putting its stamp uh, before to Crete finally falls. So you see this overarching regional struggle, which is inflaming all those hot spots that we talked Complicated. about. Complicated. Fighting Iranian-backed forces on the one hand, negotiating That's an, right. a nuclear we agreement are, with Iran on the other hand. That's right. And that is, everybody's holding their breath. The deadline is Tuesday, March the 31st. So these are complicated strategies. They're not black and white. Um, and some days, you're, you're, uh, Iran is your friend. Some days, it's your adversary. And so these old adages, the enemy of my enemy of my friend, hard to figure out when you don't know whether Iran at any moment is your adversary or your friend. Let's do uh, one last question on al-Qaeda, because they are in Yemen. It's funny. Yes. We don't hear much about al-Qaeda anymore. We will. We will. How are they in, involved well, in all they, of this? This is a big victory for al-Qaeda. Um, you know, the previous Yemeni government had allowed the United States to use drone strike to keep on decapitating al-Qaeda leaders. He's now the leader that has been forced out of Aden. Um, Al-Qaeda forces will have relatively unfettered territory now to organize, and it's going to be, if in fact, um, he is forced to flee and the Saudis don't reverse this in the next couple of weeks, going to be much tougher for the United States to attack al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. I want to ask the control for one more minute because I do want to ask one more question. You, you, you have, as, a, as a professional international affairs observer, have watched this region for a half a century. Yes. Can you ever recall a time when no. it was as messed up as it is no. right now? This really? is the worst period in the modern Middle East. Um, I, let me go out on a limb and say it's the worst period in the last 200 years. It is the most unstable period where the order has clearly broken down, Steve. Okay. Janice, thanks again so much for coming into TVO You're and helping welcome. us out with this. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.